totally for the good. What about that? Yeah, it's working, doctor. It's working. Okay. So, mm, take this new. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible, Savana? Yes. Perfect. So today I'll be uh, doing a book review of uh, Noah Scene, The Coming Age of Hyper Intelligence. Now this book isn't a technical book, it's just a vision of a future. This book is by James Lovelock. So James Lovelock is an English independent scientist, environmentalist and futurist. He's best known for proposing the Gaia theory and electron capture detector. What is English independent? Means no academic affiliation, right? Yeah. How these guys are living on the In 2006, the, Ge the Geological Society awarded James the Wollaston Medal, which is their highest award. And one interesting fact about his long career is he has filed over 50 patents for various uh, inventions uh, that he did. What year is this book? About? 2019. 2019, okay. Yes. Now, before we go deep into what is Noah's scene, why does it say the coming age of hyperintelligence, we need to understand the theory which was proposed by the author, the Gaia theory. So quick take on what is Gaia theory or Gaia hypothesis. It says or it considers our entire Earth, the planet, as one single regulating system, a single living organism. And it mentions that uh, the biosphere is one single living organism that itself can regulate and maintain stable environmental con uh, conditions which are suitable for life. So that's the whole idea which uh, author uh, has proposed, the Gaia hypothesis, which is a new view to how we look at the planet Earth and everything. So he essentially mentions that uh, we humans as we consider the center and important part of uh, uh, the world right now, we are not. And Gaia. <laughs> so now what is Noah seeing? So it is supposed to be, uh, or it is considered to be a new geological epoch where in this era of artificial intelligence will have systems which are more intelligent than, how, than the humans and will certainly or probably be able to create or reproduce themselves over the time. Now, this Noah scene will mark the end of the current period that is Anthropocene. What is Anthropocene? It's the current period in which humans have developed various technologies and performed various advancement and uh, come across various evolutions which has helped them over to intervene and understand several processes which is going on uh, in the earth. So that is uh, that period is called by the author as Anthropocene here. Now, this particular book is divided into three parts. The part one is knowing the cosmos, the knowing cosmos. Now, here in this book, there are two terminologies which we need to understand before we move further. First is the term cosmos. So instead of using the term universe, the uh, author uses the term cosmos. Now, cosmos is something, uh, is everything that we know about or we can see. And it's essentially a strict subset of the universe. So the author considers that uh, no matter how much we know, how much we can gather information, we'll never know the entire universe. And hence he uses the word cosmos. And another term which will come across uh, a little later in the slide is cyborgs. So cyborgs is considered as an intelligent AI system that can replicate itself, that can that is gonna be existing alongside humans. And what do I mean by that? We'll understand uh, a little later in the steps. So the part one, the knowing cosmos. So here in this part, the author makes two important points. The first point starts with that our cosmos is, cosmos is 13.8 billion years old. Our planet was formed 4.5 billion years ago and life began 3.7 billion years ago. And our species, Homo sapiens, is just over 300,000 years old. Now. With all these, he's trying to come to the point that uh, even if we consider that there is some other species exist uh, outside Earth, 
outside our Gaia, it it can only be electronic because given the time we have taken to evolve into such intelligent uh, species, any species that is more intelligent than us and exists outside Gaia is gonna be just electronic. By electronic, it means uh, just an it may be an intelligent system, an AI system. And further, it mentions that all these different uh, evolution, these advances that we have come across, there is one thing that has stayed the same. It's our star, the sun, which is an uh, important source of life, an important source of energy to us, and it's required for our uh, sustenance over the time. And that's an, uh, that's an interesting line, which he mentioned alongside this point, that the, atom, the atom bombs are piling up in the factories, the police are prowling through the cities. The lies are streaming from the loudspeakers, but the earth is still going round the sun. This line is given by George Orwell. So it's again saying the same thing that whatever is going on, sun is the major source. And indirectly or directly, he tries to mention that whatever we do, it's important for us to make advancement to how we utilize the energy which is given by sun over the time to uh, move forward. Further is mentioned, uh, further, uh, the author mentions various uh, natural calamities and uh, different things that uh, the earth, the Gaia has faced over the years. And uh, it says, says that the humans may become extinct because of forces far beyond our control. And so there is another interesting line, which was written by Mary Shelley, that is that says the winds were withered in the stagnant air and the clouds perished darkness had no need of aid from them she was the universe so by this line uh, the so mary shelley wrote this line for the a great calamity which basically reduced the human population to several hundred thousands 74000 years ago and uh, it says it mentions the cosmic instability of our existence and it mentions that if such an calamity uh, is uh, going to hit our, uh, our, our Gaia again. It might not wipe out the entire humanity, but it will certainly wipe out all our civilization and we might just go back to Stone Age again. Further, uh, he mentions in that, that uh, now given uh, all the different advancements we have made, uh, people are going to, uh, the scientists, NASA and uh, other scientists are trying to find life outside us. Let's say Mars. And, uh, it says that uh, even if they are able to identify some life on Mars, it's very difficult to live there. Why is it difficult to live there? Is because of the energy that is being radiated by sun every second. Now, to explain how much that energy is being radiated and why is it difficult, the author compares the atmosphere layer, which is around Mars, to that of Earth. And it mentions that uh, if, if looked from the space, Earth will, uh, Earth as a planet will be, uh, will not be classified as a habitable zone because the amount of, uh, the amount of heat that is being radiated by the Earth's uh, layer, the atmosphere layer is way more than that of Mars. But now we as a human being, as living being are still living inside the Earth. Why? Because of that thick atmospheric layer, which is not present uh, there in Mars. And that's another uh, thing it mentions that because of that atmospheric layer, because of this Gaia that's regulating the temperature, we are still able to habitate this planet. Gaia is this. Gaia is the hypothesis presented. So Gaia is essentially the entire environment, our Earth, Earth, its atmosphere, the biosphere. The, that's a name given uh, by the author to that biosphere consider it as a living organism. That's single. Okay. Yes. And now here is the uh, point where the, the author mentions about uh, the new knowers. So he says that currently we are the only people who understand, who has explored the cosmos and who uh, learn about it. But in future, the, understand, uh, the understanders will not be humans. They'll be cyborgs, which who will have designed and built themselves from the artificial intelligence systems we have already constructed or we'll be constructing. And these new uh, intelligent beings will have arisen like humans 
from Darwinian evolution, like natural selection, but not exactly natural selection. Now, before we move on to what is this Noocene, we want to understand what is the current uh, era that is going on, which, uh, and this, the end of this era will mark the start of Noocene. So that is the age of fire, Anthropocene. It is considered as by the author as the most important period of our old planet's long history. Yes. It's, it's just using uh, a lot of help from design ideas and PowerPoints. So. so Anthropocene is considered by the author as the most important period in our old planet's long history. So what happened? What are the good things? Because everything has two sides. That's like a coin, a good side and a bad side. So let's see the good side of Anthropocene, the spirit that's going on. Now, one important point that is that, that was very interesting for me that was mentioned by the author is that the evolution of Anthropocene, which has so massively changed the earth, was driven by market forces. So he mentioned very specifically, any evolution would not have grown or any advancements would not have been done if that did not bring profitability. So everything and anything that was advanced or evoluted somewhere or the other was um, affected by these market forces. So our Anthropocene starts from the invention of atmospheric steam engine by Thomas New Common, which was further uh, very popular and uh, very popular and used in the railways in the 19th century. Further, uh, we had industrial revolution, which brought great wealth. How did it bring great wealth? Because the amount of work which was uh, being done by and humans was improved and increased by uh, systems, by different industrial equipments that was uh, developed, invented. Further, uh, we accelerated towards the new in inventions in technologies, such as aircrafts, rockets, motorboats, and these uh, inventions are really important because let's say uh, a couple of hundred thousand years back, if there was a comet uh, or meteor going to hit the earth, we would not be able to deflect it or we would not be able to uh, destroy it outside our space. But now given all these advancements, we have the capability to, if not destroy, we can deflect that meteor uh, coming towards earth. And that is one uh, important uh, advantage of uh, this uh, anthrop uh, Anthropocene period. Further, instead, because of all these accelerations, so why, why is the word accelerating used? Is because what author is trying to say is that when a seabird took, uh, a, what, 80,000, a couple of hundred thousand years to become a seabird from his ancestor who is a lizard, here we are able to evolve. All these technologies are evolving very fast. And that's why here it, uh, he mentions that intelligent intentional selection appears to be a million times faster than natural selection. So this is a new term which is being mentioned by the author, intelligent or intentional selection. Now, we saw the good sides. What are the bad sides? So industrial revolution did bring great wealth, but it also brought great poverty because uh, where a human was able to fit feed their family with cheap labor, they were removed. Their jobs were replaced by the systems. There are leading uh, traces of uh, chlorofluorocarbons in the atmospheric layer, affecting the ozone uh, atmosphere and, and affecting the ozone layer, essentially. I'm not having something very uh, novel in this idea. Yeah. It's a lot of things are you know, something that we read a lot in general. Yeah, it's just a vision, Dr. Shed. So it's... Okay, we can move faster. There's nothing here, it just... Okay. So... We're learning in economy in terms of our daily science, or computer science. Okay. Uh, further, uh, he gives a shout of joy that uh, these advances have made education for all Easter lives. Expansion of knowledge, the world and the cosmos, better understanding of the earth and uh, so on. So now he, now we come to the NOAA scene, which is the coming age of hyper intelligence where the technology moves beyond our control as the author considers 
or predicts that the technology will move beyond our control and it will generate intelligence that is far greater and much faster than our own. So natural selection being replaced by intentional selection. So it mentions that uh, the intense further as soon as this technology, which is able to create themselves and learn things much faster than humans, the, the natural selection, which is considerably a lot slower, will be replaced by this intentional selection, which is much uh, faster. And uh, this intentional selection or these uh, new life forms will also be able to correct the errors in these processes and will be able to uh, replicate themselves and so on. And further, uh, it, he also mentions that uh, later on, we'll come to a, a certain Gaia in which humans will not be the only species. We'll, have, we'll be coexisting with cyborgs where uh, it will be essential to identify the synergy between humans and cyborgs and live uh, live together for the sustainable uh, sustenance of uh, humanity. Further, uh, he also mentioned that there will be potential uh, for intelligent machines to assist us in developing sustainable technology or practices. And uh, then he finally tries to. Uh, discuss the point where what is our place in their world so he mentions that once the AI, AI system starts emerging and it becomes uh, it becomes it starts evolving quickly enough to be a significant part of the biosphere so just like systems like alpha zero which is able to tease themselves from scratch these systems will also be able to take uh, different decisions radical radical things such as waging war and uh, compared to a child given the scenario where both cyborgs and humans are living together a child would take uh, some years of time to learn some skill and perform some motion a cyborg will just take uh, an hour or two hours to come to life and will be able to do much uh, more skilled works further he mentions an idea of a global brain where all these intelligent beings are interconnected and these interconnection of things might lead to developing a uh, development of a much more ethical and better technologies but at the same time these uh, systems being interconnected also uh, brings in a lot of issues with uh, trust in these systems so he ends with this uh, he ends the book with this important Somebody else find it. On the... Oh, I uh... <laughs> Okay. Uh, it should still be working. Yeah. It... You can just change the screen. Yeah. yeah. Just. The screen the and just yeah. Uh... Yeah. yeah. So he, he ends it with these uh, lines, though much is taken, much abides, and though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. So these lines says that uh, even though all the understandings and knowledge which we have gathered about the cosmos, we'll be gifting it to the intelligence systems, which will further take over. We should not be saddened by this. And we should think that whatever we have done or we are yet to do, all the memories of those will, will not be forgotten and the wisdom and understanding uh, will be sent outwards from Earth to embrace the cosmos. I just have one question mm -hmm. from this. What is an error in this framework? So uh, I think- I, I don't know, what, what, are my, what are my cyborgs being designed to optimize? <laughs> so this book, uh, as it seemed from the title, it's not, uh, it doesn't discuss much in depth of technical analysis, no empirical analysis as such, but it's just the idea or the vision of the author of that uh, side. So they're going to take over, but I just don't understand how they could be ethical or improve our environment unless we understand the difference between reality and error and what we're trying to optimize. Uh, right. So uh, I'll give. So this is how uh, 
author uh, defines this. It says that uh, before the smallest diameter of uh, wire that a human could uh, work with was uh, seven millimeters or uh, seven micrometers. Mm -hmm. But now the chips which we have in our laptops, they are made up with wires which, whose diameter is as small as 14 nanometers. So now these are the advancement which is allowing uh, the system, the, the AI system itself to to do what? To build these systems. Uh, about what? <laughs> For what purpose? What's it, what's it, right. or, or no purpose? <laughs> it, I think it's dependent on the technology that we are using. Right. Like recently there is this talk about artificial general intelligence. Yeah, somebody had, I think, made yeah. a headphones. Yeah. API. So, what API comprises of? What are the subtasks that? A agent that is capable of doing API needs to get you something. I think we need to define as we go on. Yeah. Probably the author doesn't it's, care about yeah, it. Yeah, but how we Yeah. It sounds to me, it sounds to me like his vision, what he's trying to say is that um, hyper intelligence has has he defined what is hyper intelligence? Hyper intelligence is essentially an intelligence that far surpasses our own. Yeah, so I think what he's trying to say is that according to the Darwinian evo evolution, this is probably the next step. Well, that's one thing that I heard, but I still don't know what it means to be good in that environment. The other thing that I heard is that our dependence on heat and energy mm -hmm. is a problem, and I think that is something that's something to think about more generally. I don't know the extent to which that's important for this class. Yeah, that it, it, it's not, but it's just a point that has been mentioned and how the importance is, uh, that is important for the evolution. And, and so, you know, life on Mars, if we're going to go there, um, needs to be less dependent on heat in order to function. And I, as I understood the argument, moving to cyborgs is a potential way to be less dependent on those energy sources for processing. <laughs> but I still don't understand what it means to be good or what it means to be bad. It means the, the good part is uh, it, it essentially saying that whatever we are able to compute, it can compute faster. So whatever technology is good. No, so that has both the sides. It's good and it's bad. It, oh, no, I mean, it's, just a, it's a total horizontal <coughs> dimension. They being fast is not the same thing, uh, always as in good, and I still don't know what good means. I think that uh, like in computer science, uh, they've defined genetic algorithm based optimization versus uh, uh, optimality based optimization. Mm -hmm. So in genetic algorithm, the intuitive way to think about it is survive better than your current generation. And optimality, like the <coughs> descent is survival of the fittest. No one cares if you're other people are, you, if you're still better than everybody around you, that's not good enough. You, you, get, uh, you get to the most optimum that you can get. But it, still, there's this notion of adaptation to the environment. Mm -hmm. That sounds like we both of these. So I think he said that the, the genetic algorithm way of relaxing once you're better than your peers. Mm -hmm. So more intelligent connection. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I like your group. Yeah, so the slides are really good. Uh, so, did, did you read what uh, Divergent Movie Series? Well, the one which is adapted from the book written by Veronica Roth. Yeah. So, there are four movies of this? Three. So, whatever this author says, so it's very resembling those series. Oh. I haven't, but I'll surely do. There were a few points which were very similar to the book I did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But at one point, it sounded like the authors were like antithesis of each other, like not. So I think it's a compilation of both sapiens and what you presented. Look like. Yeah, yeah, it's historic and. The point where you know this author mentioned that uh, the guy or the earth is what is regulating itself, the self-regulating, whereas um, your author said that you know we are like the superior species. So that, that is where I found like a disagreement, but otherwise similar theme. Yeah.
Kasparov. Okay. On the prompt that you are seeing on the screen. Stop recording or? Oh.